Justice. And that concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Number one from Jackson Carr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And since today is his last First Minister's questions after 20 years, can I take this opportunity to thank Sir Paul Grice for his service to our Parliament and wish him well. Good news this morning for people in Resyth and also excellent news for those enduring cystic fibrosis. First class announcements both. Less good news though if you're hoping to attend the Sick Kids Hospital. Formally proposed in 2008, originally scheduled to be opened by 2013, the Sick Kids Hospital repeatedly delayed. Four health secretaries, blunders, cost overruns. And yet it's only yesterday that the Scottish Government decides to appoint a troubleshooter to sort this mess out. First Minister, isn't this just too little, too late? Yeah. First Minister. Well, first of all, can I take the opportunity also to uh, thank Sir Paul Grice for his incredible contribution to the Scottish Parliament, that it has become the established institution of our democracy over a period of just 20 years is in no small way down to yeah. his efforts and his contributions. So I'm sure the whole chamber wishes him well for the future. Um, can I also warmly welcome the news this morning that Babcock has been selected as the preferred bidder uh, for the five Type 31 frigates. That is good news for Resyth and I hope it will also be good news uh, for the wider supply chain across Scotland. The Scottish Government will certainly be working hard to make sure that is the case. Um, and lastly, because it has also been mentioned, can I take the opportunity uh, to welcome the fact that the Scottish Government has now reached an agreement with the manufacture of two cystic fibrosis drugs to make sure that they are available now to patients. We are the first UK nation to do so, and I think that is news that will be warmly welcomed, not just across this chamber, but across the country. Um, turning to the situation at the uh, Edinburgh Sick Kids Hospital, can I uh, make abundantly clear today that the situation is unacceptable. Um, to say that I and the Health Secretary are angry about uh, this situation would be an understatement, and I know that anger is shared by patients and staff. Uh, the focus of the Scottish Government is on putting this right. Uh, firstly, and the Health Secretary made this very clear at the start of the summer, that we will not allow the hospital to open until we are satisfied about patient safety. Um, secondly, the Health Secretary instructed work to firstly establish uh, the work that requires to be done uh, to bring the hospital up to specification um, and secondly to establish the reason for the problem with the critical care ventilation system. Both of those reports were published yesterday. I think the Health Secretary has met with or is meeting uh, with opposition spokespeople uh, today. In respect of the project, uh, we have escalated uh, our oversight to level four, which means that there will be uh, closer uh, scrutiny and oversight. Uh, so there is an absolute focus in making sure that these problems are rectified and I think that is what the public, patients and staff would expect to see from the Scottish Government. Jackson Carla. <laughs> Look, First Minister, anger is all very well, but you didn't need to be a high-ranking government minister to know that there were major problems with this vital project going back years. You only had to read a newspaper. <laughs> Yet we've had a Scottish Government with its head buried in the sand. So let me ask a specific question. In November last year, independent assessors made crystal clear that the hospital couldn't be made operational. So deep were the problems, staff were actually emailed and told they couldn't even be given a completion date. Didn't that ring alarm bells? First Minister. Can I just be very clear to Jackson Carlow, there were a number of issues identified and indeed publicly reported before July 2019. These are the reasons why the hospital was already late in opening. Um, in fact, the KPGMP report provides a comprehensive uh, summary of those issues. Uh, but the issue uh, that has resulted in the delay that the Health Secretary uh, confirmed to Parliament yesterday uh, is an issue relating to the critical care ventilation system that only came to light uh, at the start of July this year. Now, if Jackson Carlow is telling me he knew about that before then, then perhaps the question is why he didn't bring that to uh, anybody else's attention, because I uh, didn't know about it and the Health Secretary uh, didn't know about that. Uh, that is... That is the issue that has prevented the hospital opening now. 
Uh, and that is the issue uh, that the Health Secretary is focused on ensuring is rectified. And we will continue to focus on that work as the Health Secretary set out in her statement to Parliament yesterday. Jackson Carlo. Yes, well, that was a new spin in project management shift there, I must say. <laughs> Uh, you know, presiding officer, the six ki ki sick kids hospital is just 10 minutes drive from where we all are now. And yet it seems that four successive health ministers chose either not to know or simply failed to ask about the full extent of the problems faced until way, way too late. And the truth is, when it comes to this project, confusion reigned. For example, in June, the health secretary was confident enough about the project to tell MSPs in this chamber that everything was on track. And yet just a week later, the health board told her that those assurances were unfounded. I mean, what an absolute shambles. Does that sound to the First Minister like joined up government? First Minister. But firstly, the previous issues that had been identified uh, had been resolved, which is why the Health Secretary uh, gave uh, the comments she gave to Parliament in June. Uh, the issue that has resulted in this delay didn't come to light until the start of July. I didn't know about that. Uh, the senior management in the health board, as far as I am aware, did not know about that. And the health secretary didn't know about that. As soon as that came to light, the health secretary acted properly and appropriately. It would have been wrong to allow that hospital to open uh, before assurances about patient safety could have been given. There has been substantial work done over the summer to make sure that any other uh, issues uh, have been identified. That was the subject of the National Services Scotland report that was published yesterday. And there has been substantial work done now to set out a timescale for the rectification uh, particularly to the critical care ventilation system to be carried out uh, and a timescale to be laid out for the opening uh, both of the Sick Kids Hospital and of the Department for Clinical Neurosciences. Uh, that is the responsible action the Health Secretary has taken. Uh, we will continue uh, to make sure that that work is carried out so that the hospital does open. I deeply regret the hospital will be opening uh, late, extremely uh, late, uh, and it is important that we make sure that every issue that has been identified is addressed so that when it does open, it is safe for the patients who will use that hospital. Jackson Carla. <clears throat> well, that's all very well, First Minister, but since January 2013, when the new Sick Kids was supposed to have opened, over 300,000 children have been denied access to the new hospital that they and their parents were entitled to expect, in a &E alone. This is a saga from which nobody emerges well, not the health board, not the contractor, and certainly not this government. And it's a saga that is altogether sadly too predictable. Ministerial assurances given, completion dates put back, costs spiral out of control. And at the end of it all, it seems absolutely nobody is held to account. First Minister, I think the country thinks for once heads should roll, don't you? First Minister. Well, the Health Secretary, of course, oh, wow. set out uh, yesterday the uh, work that will be done to establish issues of accountability within the Health Board. It is important that that is done in line with due process. Uh, the focus is on making sure uh, that the rectification work is done, particularly in the critical care unit, although there were other aspects of work that the NSS report identified that will be taken uh, forward in parallel. Uh, the Health Secretary also confirmed yesterday, I announced it in the programme for government last week, uh, that we will be setting up a new national uh, body, a centre of excellence to oversee in particular the construction and technical specification aspects of these new builds. The uh, Scottish Government oversight traditionally looks at uh, finances and the delivery timelines. Uh, so lessons absolutely have to be learned from this. I uh, very much agree that this is a completely unacceptable situation. Uh, but our focus will remain patient safety uh, and that should be the priority of everybody uh, who has anything to do with this project. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, can I add uh, my thanks uh, and best wishes to Paul Grice? Uh, I've known him for longer than probably either of us would care to admit, but he's been a figure of great stability in this parliament since its very inception, a source of wise counsel, and he will be a very hard act to follow, and we wish him well. <laughs> Presiding officer, in March of this year, my colleague Daniel Johnson asked the Cabinet Secretary for Health in this chamber, and I quote, if the issues at the Edinburgh Sick Kids coupled with the issues at the Queen Elizabeth point to wider problems regarding hospital building and procurement in the National Health Service in Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary, 
with her customary disdain, replied, and I quote, I do not think that the issues point to wider problems, and accused Daniel Johnson of being wide of the mark. But he wasn't First Minister, was he? First Minister. Well, there, there have, Richard Leonard is absolutely right to point out, there have been issues with the Queen Elizabeth, uh, and there are clearly uh, problems now uh, with the Sick Kids Hospital. Uh, there have been other hospitals built uh, without uh, those issues. Uh, but the question here, of course, is about how we ensure appropriate oversight. That is why the announcement that I've just referred to about the establishment of a new body, which I, I would have hoped is something that Labour would welcome, to make sure that we are reflecting carefully um, on the issues that have arisen in these uh, two hospitals. Uh, our focus is very much on ensuring that the problem that was identified in early July around the ventilation system is put right. That has been the focus of the work done over the summer uh, to get to the point uh, that the Health Secretary announced yesterday uh, and that focus will continue. That's what uh, we owe to the patients and the staff of that hospital is to put those issues right and make sure that when it does open it is a safe hospital for the patients who will use it. Richard Leonard. Is the First Minister really telling the people of Scotland that the answer to this abject failure in new hospital building is the creation of another public body as yet unnamed? The report that came out yesterday told us some important truths. Firstly, that the Scottish Government was on the programme board for this project. That frequent, frequent meetings were held between NHS Lothian and the Scottish Government, and I quote, in order to allow the Cabinet Secretary to be briefed. Yet the Cabinet Secretary told this chamber in March that it is excellent news that the board will take over the hospital from July and that patients will be in it from then. So we know who is wide of the mark now. Yesterday, the Cabinet Secretary for Health was forced to come to this parliament to admit that this major facility of strategic importance will not now open until autumn 2020. The Cabinet Secretary was wrong on her response that the hospital would open in July. Does the First Minister also accept that the Cabinet Secretary was wrong in dismissing the wider issues of hospital building and procurement? First Minister. Nobody, nobody is dismissing any of these serious issues. In terms of the Cabinet Secretary's statement to Parliament in June, uh, at that point, that was our firm expectation that the hospital would open uh, in July. All of the issues that had previously been identified had been resolved, and that was the information uh, that the Cabinet Secretary and uh, the Scottish Government had. An issue then came to light uh, that hadn't previously been known to us. Uh, the KPMG report published yesterday uh, sets out, in summary, it's a, a long and a technical report, but in summary it sets out uh, that a particular document called the Environmental Matrix had had in part the wrong specification for the ventilation system. That is something that the board uh, should have picked up and the report sets out opportunities for that to have done, but it wasn't done. When that came to light in the start of July, the Health Secretary took the action that has been uh, reported to this Parliament and set in train the work uh, that requires to be done to rectify that problem and ensure that the hospital opens safely. That is the responsible conduct uh, of a Health Secretary focused in making sure that patient safety is the overriding priority. Yeah. Richard Leonard. But this is a hospital that was already way over timetable. Does the First Minister not understand just how angry people are about this? We've got a children's hospital in Edinburgh that can't open its doors, and we were reminded at the weekend that we have a hospital in Glasgow built by the same contractor that has been closing its doors to a children's cancer ward. And Audit Scotland is saying that there needs to be a review of whole project contracting to help with preventative and reactive measures. We need to get to the bottom of this. We need full public transparency to restore public trust. So what will it take? for the First Minister to finally listen and deliver a full public inquiry into this abject failure of governance and government. First Minister. The Scottish Government will 
continue to do the work and take the action to rectify the issue uh, that has been identified at the Sick Kids in Edinburgh. That is the responsible thing to do. Uh, Richard Leonard said, do I understand the anger? Yes, I absolutely do. I share the anger uh, that patients and staff feel about this thoroughly unacceptable situation. Uh, the Health Board's uh, responsibility was to ensure that this hospital was built to the right specification. In this respect, it hasn't discharged that responsibility and there are questions that still require uh, to be asked in that respect. Our job now is to make sure uh, that the work is done to rectify that, that that work is done as quickly as possible, that it is done to the requisite standards and when that hospital opens it is a safe environment for the patients who will use it and the Scottish Government will remain absolutely focused on discharging that responsibility. We have some constituency supplementaries. The first from John Mason to be followed by Alexander Stewart. John Mason. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, given the problems that have been around marches in Glasgow over the last two weekends, uh, does the First Minister ag agree that uh, Glasgow City Council has made the right decision by prohibiting marches this weekend? First Minister. Um, yes, I do think the City Council has arrived at the right decision in not giving permission for the marches uh, that were planned for this weekend. Um, I believe, as I said uh, last week, that the right to march is an important part of our democracy. Uh, but those who are abusing that right, uh, I think, are putting it into jeopardy uh, for others. It is also vital that the rights of the majority of law-abiding citizens are uh, protected and uh, given priority. Uh, so I think Glasgow City Council has taken uh, the right decision. Obviously, it takes those decisions in light of the advice it receives from the police. I think there are longer-term questions about whether uh, there are changes required to the law, and we will continue to have that dialogue with Glasgow City Council. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, like me, you are delighted that the news that five new Type 31 frigates are to be built at Resize by a consortium led by Babcock. This contract will secure millions of pounds into my region of Mid Scotland and Fife and guarantee hundreds of jobs. This once again goes to show the outstanding skills of the Scottish workforce and the strength of the United Kingdom when orders of this nature are guaranteed and secured. Will the First Minister join with me in welcoming this boost to the Scottish economy? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do think this is good news for the Scottish economy. I also think it is a real tribute to the expertise of the workforce at uh, Resythe. Um, I'm not going to uh, dwell on the fact that this is, uh, you know, the, the promises that were made years ago in terms of the number of Type 26 frigates were not uh, kept, but this, because this is good news. Our job now, and the Finance Secretary has spoken to Babcock this morning, uh, where he congratulated them and gave them the assurance that they had the full support of the Scottish Government. So we need to work with them now to make sure that the benefit, not just to Recyth, although that is obviously significant, but the benefit to the whole Scottish supply chain is realised. Obviously, we hope uh, that there may be benefits to Ferguson Marine um, in the course of this as well. So we will continue to work uh, with the company and the workforce to make sure all of these benefits are realised. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Can I thank the First Minister and Jean Freeman for listening to cystic fibrosis campaigners like my constituent Kelly Gallagher and agreeing a deal with Vertex to make Orkambi and Simkevi free for all on the NHS. Can I ask the First Minister though what arrangements are in place with health boards to ensure that patients receive medication quickly? First Minister. Uh, well, we will make sure uh, that uh, the impact of this announcement today about the agreement between the Scottish Government and the manufacturers fully reflected in the decisions that health boards take. I think this is good news. This has not been uh, an easy uh, agreement to arrive at. There have been a number of complexities. I think it is good news that we have arrived at it. It is a five-year agreement that, of course, will allow uh, data about the benefits of these drugs to uh, be gathered as well. And there may be lessons in this for uh, our approach to other uh, drugs as well. Uh, but I know there will be uh, cystic fibrosis patients and their families across the country today who are very relieved about this. Uh, and I know that everybody will welcome what is exceptionally good news. Andy Whiteman to be followed by Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And first of all, on behalf of the Scottish Green Party, I too would like to congratulate Paul Grice on his 20 years of service and his good humour 
and wise counsel to us all. First Minister, you'll be aware that uh, there's a planned school climate strike next Friday, and you may also be aware that the City of Edinburgh uh, Council has refused permission for the planned rally to use certain streets in the capital. Now, whilst such decisions are properly for the Council, in light of media reports uh, that young people may face arrest or be locked up, does she agree with me that this is nonsense? That no young person will face such action for exercising their rights to peaceful protest, and that we should all reassure uh, young people that, we should, that they have the right to peaceful protest and that they should be encouraged and supported to exercise it. First Minister. Well, two, two things. Issues around permission and roads, etc., are for uh, the Council. Uh, obviously, issues around, um, around arrests and criminal justice generally here, I'm not talking in, in this particular instance, are for the police, and it would be thoroughly inappropriate for me to comment um, on operational matters. Uh, but generally speaking, in, in relation to the climate strikers, I've made very clear in the past my views. I think they are views that accord very closely to Andy Whiteman's. I think it is actually very positive, uh, very heartening, uh, very uplifting to see uh, the younger generation feel so passionate about climate change that they are prepared to protest uh, and make their views known in the way that they are and I would hope that all of us would listen to that uh, and take account of what the younger generation are telling us. I know this government is and I hope governments across the world uh, do so I wish uh, those who are taking part in the protest uh, next Friday the very best. And Liam Kerr. Thank you presiding officer. First Minister last weekend Kiko Milano in Aberdeen announced it will close with the loss of all jobs and it was reported that this was partly down to the eye-watering business rates faced by businesses in our city. So will the First Minister heed the demands of businesses in Aberdeen and instruct her Finance Minister to review the rates regime or stand by whilst more Aberdeen businesses go under? First Minister. Well, of course, in terms of the business rates uh, regime, it has very recently uh, been reviewed and a number of changes have been taken forward. In terms of individual decisions, uh, they are uh, taken independently by the valuation uh, system. Uh, we have uh, one of, if not the most competitive uh, business rates regimes anywhere in the UK and we will continue to look at how we uh, support businesses in all parts of our country, particularly given the increasingly difficult circumstances they face as a result of Brexit. And question number three, Willie Rennie. Can I too thank Paul Grice for his work and wish him well for the future too. Uh, I think we are closer than ever in our efforts to stop Brexit. But the publication today of the Yellowhammer paper lays bare the mass disruption to our way of life that would come with a no-deal Brexit. Yet that's one that Boris Johnson's Conservatives want to embrace. What's most shocking is that these horrors are the prediction of the Conservative government itself, yet still they plough on. Can the First Minister tell us if any of the details laid out in the Yellowhammer paper that were published this morning were new to the Scottish Government? And if so, what new measures she is putting in place to mitigate this damage? First Minister. Well, I, I do think the publication of the Yellowhammer planning assumptions yesterday lays bare for the public the horrors of a no-deal Brexit. And it, it is shocking that it has taken so long uh, for that information to be published. Can I uh, very directly uh, say to Willie Rennie, in terms of Yellowhammer planning assumptions, what we have seen in the Scottish Government is what was published uh, last night. Uh, the only difference I can uh, confirm is in the title of the document. Uh, the version we had had the title base scenario rather than reasonable worst case scenario uh, as appeared uh, on the document that was published last night. It's for the UK government to explain if there is any significance to that. Uh, we have been expecting an update of that document which is dated the 2nd of August. We haven't yet received an update of it. We also received the papers for the cabinet subcommittee meetings. We are invited to so far though since the new government took office that's only only been four out of around 30. The Deputy First Minister has just come from one of those this morning. We also uh, know there's a series of mitigation plans lying behind uh, these planning assumptions. In terms of our own work, uh, we are planning on the basis of the Yellowhammer assumptions, although we have been and continue to await the update of that, and we have a range of mitigation plans in place. Uh, we are currently considering what format of this information it will be most helpful to publish, uh, and we intend to make a statement to Parliament about that as soon as possible. Willie Rennie. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that answer? This is affecting real people's lives right now. Anna Ruth Cockerham from St Andrews has a chronic condition. It's called functional neurological disorder. She takes controlled medication that can only be prescribed 28 days at a time. Any break in medication worsens her seizures and the pain can last 
for weeks. Her prescription is due at the end of October and she is anxious about her health in the event of a no-deal Brexit. This is the real-life consequences of the Conservatives' cavalier approach to Brexit. Anna Ruth wants government to allow prescriptions of these controlled drugs to be issued two weeks early to ensure there is no break in the supply. Has the First Minister made arrangements for this to happen? First Minister. Uh, I'm happy to provide uh, more specific information on that specific point. We are uh, doing everything we can to mitigate any impact on drugs and medicine supplies. Obviously, the key player in this is the UK government, and to some extent, uh, we are dependent on the information flow that comes from the UK government. But we have a range of mitigation plans in place, and I will undertake, uh, not, not just to Willie Rennie, but to Parliament generally, to consider, as I said a moment ago, how we best publish this information, both about assumptions and about our mitigation plans that inform Parliament, but also inform the wider public. Uh, Willie Rennie is right to say that it is uh, beggar's belief and is completely outrageous that we have a government that is prepared to contemplate a scenario that in its own planning assumptions uh, says could result in delays to the supply of medicine and the Yellowhammer document that was published last night is very clear about the restrictions of stockpiling uh, to mitigate against uh, those impacts. So um, I share Willie Rennie's deep concern about this. I, I share his anger that we are in this situation. I give an undertaking that the Scottish Government will do everything we can to mitigate these impacts. But I also have a duty to be frank with people that we will not be able to do everything to mitigate every impact of this. Um, and it's important over these next few weeks that we have that very frank uh, dialogue with this parliament and with the wider public as we help uh, those uh, members of the public to prepare uh, as well as they possibly can. Thank you. There's a few further supplementary questions. Uh, the first from Maureen Watt to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Maureen Watt. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, in advance of a major UK-wide conference tomorrow uh, on the serious problem of knife violence and the fact that a five-year study in Edinburgh found that of sharp in instruments used in homicides, 94% were kitchen knives, would she agree with me that Scotland can be at the forefront of the campaign to replace sharp pointed knives that have been proven to have had significant penetrative capabilities with round-ended ones? First Minister. Um, yes, I, I think there is the potential for Scotland to be at the forefront of initiatives like that. Uh, Maureen Watt is right to raise this very important issue. Uh, tackling. Uh, violence from nice and indeed all forms of violence is a priority for this government and indeed for any government our approach to knife crime in particular is focused firmly on prevention and early intervention uh, over the past decade police recorded crimes of handling an offensive weapon have fallen and emergency admissions to hospitals have uh, fallen uh, but we recognize the devastating consequences that violence has on individuals families and communities so we know that much more needs to be done uh, that's why we continue to invest in no knives better lives the scottish violence reduction unit and medics against violence and we are as uh, i said at the outset we are very open to exploring any evidence showing that anti-stab knives are an effective approach to tackling violent crime. Thank you. Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Anas Sarwar. Thank you, presiding officer. Last week, the government published the Children's Scotland Bill. Many respondents to the consultation, including two of my constituents here in the gallery today, um, asked for, that there should be a presumption in law in favour of granting grandparents an automatic right of access to contact with their grandchildren. On three other occasions in this chamber, prior to the bill's publication, the Minister for Community Safety had advised that next steps in regards to this were being considered. Can the First Minister please advise for what reason this presumption was not included in the bill, and will this government ever introduce or consider such a presumption? First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, uh, can I welcome Michelle Ballantyne's constituents to the chamber? Can I uh, say two things? Firstly, I will ask the relevant minister to write to her to give uh, detail of the consideration of this particular provision that has been made and the reasons why it is not uh, included in the bill. But the second, perhaps more important point I would make, uh, which Michelle Ballantyne alluded to herself, is that this bill is at its very early stages. It is currently open for 
consultation. It will then go through the normal stage one uh, process. So it's open uh, to individuals, to organisations, indeed to members of this parliament to bring forward suggestions for amendment. And there will be opportunity for the committee and parliament as a whole to consider those. And I would uh, encourage uh, Michelle Ballantyne's uh, constituents, if they uh, feel that they have evidence to bring to bear to this, uh, to take part in that consultation and that process. And I saw our to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Presenting officer, next week Scotland's whisky workers are taking unprecedented strike action to try and win a pay offer that meets the cost of living. Their employer, Diageo, is a large and important employer, plays a key part in Scotland's economy and has a strong reputation nationally and internationally. It also records a pre-tax profit of more than £4 billion and awarded a 30% pay rise to their chief executive. Does the First Minister agree with me that this is a business that can well afford to give their workers at Shield Hall in Glasgow leaving in Fife and distilleries all around Scotland a fair pay rise and will she join me in calling on Diageo to get back around the table with the GMB and Unite Unions and find a fair resolution? First Minister. Um, firstly I am aware uh, of this dispute in general terms Diageo is, and Asarwar has uh, just alluded to as a private company I'm not aware of all of the details uh, of the dispute but I hope uh, my commitment to fair work and to fair treatment of workers is well known, so I would absolutely uh, join with Anna Sarwar in calling on Diageo to get back round the table with the trade unions, uh, Unite and GMB, to find a fair resolution to this uh, in the interests of their workforce. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister how the current suspension of the UK Parliament affects her government and this Parliament's preparations for Brexit? And why, if prorogation is unlawful, Westminster isn't back to work? First Minister. Well, firstly, in terms of the practical uh, implications of the UK Parliament being suspended, I think, uh, particularly in light of the publication of the Yellow Hammer planning assumptions last night, it is vital that Parliament is there scrutinising and holding to account this government. And that would be a helpful process in terms of the Scottish Government's uh, own planning to try to get as much information out of the UK Government as possible. But I think the big question for the Prime Minister and the Government this morning is why on earth Parliament is still suspended. We had Scotland's highest civil court yesterday declaring the prorogation of Parliament as unlawful. Parliament should be back to work scrutinising this government because if any government needed scrutinising, uh, this UK government certainly does. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, yesterday the Court of Session ruled that the First Minister acted unlawfully by prolonging the... Prime Minister. I, I do beg your pardon. I do beg your pardon. I would never suggest any inappropriateness on the part of the First Minister. Uh, yesterday, the Court of Session ruled that the Prime Minister acted unlawfully by proroguing the UK Parliament. Regardless of whether we agree with any individual judgment, does the First Minister agree it's outrageous that Downing Street sources seek to undermine the Court with a Minister on TV implying that the judges were biased? And can the First Minister outline what action the Scottish Government will take to defend the judiciary from these outrageous and unfounded attacks? First Minister. Well, I'm uh, very glad, firstly, that John Ferry clarified that it was the Prime Minister that was found by the Court of Session yesterday to have acted unlawfully. I mean, yesterday's uh, judgment is of huge constitutional significance. Um, as I said yesterday, I said again today, I think the political implications of it should be straightforward. Parliament should be back in session uh, immediately. Uh, but if that wasn't bad enough yesterday, what we heard uh, directly and indirectly from uh, key people or people within uh, the Conservative Party uh, attacking the independence and the integrity of the judiciary was absolutely disgraceful and shocking. I have to say I was glad to hear Jackson Carlow and others on the Tory benches here uh, defend the integrity and the independence of the judiciary. Whatever our views on uh, individual judgments, uh, our uh, court system is a vital part of our democracy and the separation of powers. Uh, and I think it is not just wrong, uh, but deeply dangerous uh, for politicians of any party uh, to attack the independence of the judiciary. And I think it is incumbent on all of us to stand up for that. First number four, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government is providing to people struggling to meet funeral costs. First Minister. 
Uh, from next Monday, we will start providing funeral support payments. Uh, this will provide much needed help with the cost of arranging a funeral for people on low income benefits. As with all of uh, the Scottish benefits, we've simplified the process and removed the barriers to applying. We've also made changes to eligibility so that around 40% more people will be able to access this support than would receive help under the predecessor UK government scheme. The payment complements work already undertaken by the government to tackle funeral poverty, including our guidance on funeral costs, which encourages providers to make the cost of their services more transparent and accessible. Richard Lyle. I thank the First Minister for that answer and welcome, uh, indeed welcome, what is being done. With this month marking the first anniversary of the Social Security Scotland, it is clear what a positive difference the Scottish Government has already made with new powers over Social Security especially compared to the UK system it replaced. While this is, of course, welcome, does the First Minister think the Scottish Government will always be limited in what it can achieve when the majority of powers are still held in the hands of an incompetent and uncaring government at Westminster, which is entirely distracted with Brexit chaos? First Minister. Well, Richard Lyle is absolutely correct. There are many people uh, who are receiving financial support in Scotland that would not be receiving that support if the Scottish Government hadn't taken responsibility for these benefits. So I think we are demonstrating day in and day out, uh, in practical and tangible terms, uh, the real value of having these powers lying in the hands of a democratically elected Scottish Parliament and not in the hands of a Westminster Government, particularly a Tory Westminster Government. So um, I think it is common sense to look at the experience of our delivery of benefits so far and come to the conclusion if you weren't already of that view which I of course already was that, that the sooner we have the entirety of welfare decisions in the hands of this parliament and out of the hands of a Tory Westminster government the better for all of us. Question number five Alexander Burnett. Uh, can I thank the presiding officer and ask the first minister when an action plan for delivery of residential services for drug and alcohol rehabilitation across the country will be provided in line with its drug and alcohol strategy. First minister. Uh, we're currently engaging with stakeholders on the draft action plan with a view to publishing the finalised plan in October uh, for the rights, respect and recovery strategy. Uh, this will include actions on residential rehabilitation and support the development of more effective services across Scotland. Uh, clearly, the recent drugs death figure shows that we are facing a public health emergency, which is why we've also announced an additional £20 million over the next two years to support efforts across the country to bring these numbers down. Alexander Burnett. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for this announcement and I understand for including the actions called for by the Aberdeenshire Drug and Alcohol Partnership. However, this was communicated to them yesterday by telephone and it would seem in response to my lodging of this question and being picked up by the Press and Journal. So can I ask the First Minister when her government will start to tackle this issue proactively rather than in reaction to bad headlines? First Minister. Ge my genuine apologies, I'm not entirely aware of the uh, phone call that uh, the member is uh, referring to. I'm very happy to, to look into that. But uh, the government is uh, dealing with this and responding to this proactively. We have acknowledged, I think rightly, and I think this is a view shared, that we face a, a public health emergency. Uh, we recognise that increased investment is necessary, which is why the £20 million that I referred to today was announced in the programme for government. But we also recognise that we need to do things differently. We need to be open to new approaches, which is why, for example, and it is only one part of uh, the overall solution here, not the whole story, which is uh, one of the reasons why we continue to press the Home Office uh, to either allow or devolve powers to the Scottish Government to enable us to allow the safe consumption facility that Glasgow is uh, so keen to see because experts say that can have a uh, can make a difference so we will continue to make the investment um, and to be open to new approaches and I would encourage everybody across the chamber uh, to do likewise this is something we should uh, absolutely be prepared to come together on uh, and be determined to tackle. Juna Robinson. Uh, on those new approaches, um, can the, the First Minister say what communication the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government on the drug death crisis, including the use of supervised overdose prevention rooms to help reduce uh, drug deaths in Scotland? And does she believe the approach of the UK Government reflects the spirit of working together on this important issue? First Minister. Well, uh, 
firstly, we received uh, communication from the UK government uh, towards the end of last week, uh, confirming their current position on the safe consumption uh, room uh, proposal. I deeply regret that. I do believe that we all have a duty to look at new approaches. I, am, I readily concede that this is not the only answer, but experts say it is a significant part of the answer, and therefore I call again on the Home Office to reconsider their position. Uh, also, regrettably, uh, the Home Office indicated that they would not be prepared to take part in the drug summit uh, that we have uh, said that we are going to convene in Glasgow. Again, I think that is the wrong decision and I take the opportunity today to ask them to reconsider that. We should be coming together. Uh, I absolutely recognise the uh, principal responsibility that lies on the shoulders of, of my government, but drugs law is largely reserved and therefore we need the active cooperation of the UK government to make sure we have a fully holistic approach to this. So I hope they will think again about both of the aspects of that letter and come to different conclusions. Thank you. I would note that uh, yet again there's quite a lot of interest across the chamber in asking supplementaries on this issue, but uh, we don't have enough time. There'll be an opportunity to participate in a members' debate later in the week. Uh, can I call question six, Monica Lennon? Thank you, presiding officer. The members' uh, business starts immediately after FMQs, so please don't rush away. But to ask the first minister what the Scottish government's response is to reported concerns for patient and staff safety at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. First Minister. Uh, the safety and well-being of patients and staff at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital and indeed at all hospitals is the absolute priority. Uh, we welcome the input of NHS Education for Scotland and the General Medical Council who are part of an independent scrutiny regime across NHS Scotland with regard to doctors and training. Um, I expect NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to work closely with these bodies to implement their recommendations and the GMC I know has welcomed the progress that's been made so far. Uh, following recent concerns, uh, the Health Secretary of course commissioned an independent review of the process of procurement and delivery of the hospital and how it contributes to effective infection prevention. Uh, the co-chairs of that review made a call for evidence in June and are currently assessing what has been received so far. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for her answer. The Herald and Herald on Sunday have reported that children with cancer have been hit by infections at the hospital. The kids' cancer ward remained closed to new admissions. Safety faults at Edinburgh sick kids were caught hours before patients moved in, but the problems at the Queen Elizabeth only became public after it opened and are affecting some of Scotland's sickest children right now. Both hospitals were built by the same contractor. <coughs> Can the First Minister vouch for the safety of children and other patients at the Queen Elizabeth? Is she satisfied and will she apologise for the shocking feelings at this hospital? First Minister. Well, I think as I have said in this chamber before, I uh, have no hesitation in apologising to any patient who doesn't get the treatment that they have a right to expect in our National Health Service. The vast majority, the overwhelming majority of patients do, but when the NHS falls short of the expected standards, uh, there is a duty uh, for lessons to be learned uh, and for apologies to be made, and I have never uh, hesitated in that. In terms of the safety of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, uh, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital provides uh, some of the best health care uh, anywhere in the world. It has some of the best health care staff. They provide exemplary care uh, to patients day in and day out. Uh, where issues arise in their uh, are uh, issues with infection, which are not unique. Infection, as uh, we've debated in this chamber before, unfortunately is a challenge for healthcare systems across the world. It is absolutely essential that the right actions are taken. Infection prevention is vital, infection control uh, is vital, and we expect health boards to put in place the right processes uh, to keep patients in their hospitals uh, safe. That is what everybody has a right to expect from our National Health Service. Uh, thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. Uh, can I just add, um, in the 20 years I've had the pleasure of knowing our Clerk and Chief Executive, Sir Paul Grice, I've never known him as a, at a loss for words. Uh, but if I could just explain to members, to the gallery and to those following proceedings that uh, other than swearing in members, uh, our officials are not allowed to take part in formal proceedings and so Paul cannot respond to any of these uh, kind tributes that were paid to him uh, this afternoon. There will be an event after Parliament this evening at which myself, other members of staff and members of Parliament will be able to talk about uh, Paul's leadership role in building the reputation of this institution and he will be able to respond. And, uh, unencumbered by office, tell us what he really thinks of the members of this parliament. 
And on that note, uh, I'm going to suspend before we resume with uh, members' business. A short suspension.